Deirdre Kelly is a talented short story writer from Donegal. Since 2021, she has been part of the Dunkerns Creative Collective and is a regular on stage reading at events where her words have captivated audiences. Although Deirdre now resides in Belfast, the town of Letterkenny is where she calls home. And it is here that we met Deirdre to learn more about this promising young writer, including what it was like growing up in the Northwest. I really love Letterkenny. There's definitely mixed opinions about it, but I really love it. I think people from here are very nice and very kind and very warm people generally, and also great storytellers. So I think that that's had um, a real influence on me. I've just grown up around people who are able to just bring out a great yarn at like a moment's notice. And I think that I've always wanted to capture that a bit, that humor and that kind of spontaneity. People always tell me that I like talk a lot about my family and tell a lot of stories about my family. I've definitely been very, very influenced by them. I'm the youngest of six children. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of influence to be, to be had. My family are all, I think really into the arts and reading and drama. I have three older brothers and two older sisters and when I was wee, um, me and my older sisters used to sit in the bunk beds in their room and uh, read poetry, which sounds really ridiculous and pretentious, but that's what we did. <laughs> my mommy, um, my mommy's always very involved in um, in amateur drama. Um, her father, my grandfather, Terry O'Doherty, um, kind of co-founded the Lifford Players, who are a very, very noted um, local um, amateur drama group. And he would have produced um, really great plays and acted in plays. And my mommy followed in his footsteps and won Best Actress at Athlone, the All Irelands. Uh, she's a speech and drama teacher as well. And I did my up to grade eight was of speech and drama with her. So. Um, uh, yeah, she's had a massive influence on me and if I, if I can read well at all, if I can read out loud well at all, it's all, it's all down to my mommy. <laughs> well, I've always really, really had um, such an urge to write. I've always been um, a real reader. When I was wee, I just, I would try and write stuff and I would not be able to finish anything or it would all be completely useless. I just thought, well, I clearly want to do this, but I have no ability, I can't do anything. And then about four years ago or something, um, stuff, stories finally started coming out a bit right. I've always been interested in, um, in kind of realism, in um, stories of, of real people and realistic characters. And I think that I just, I wasn't able to write before because I hadn't, hadn't experienced anything. I think I had to, not that I've had any particularly mad <laughs> life experiences, but I just, I think I had to be a person in the world for a while before anything came out making any sense. I think I just find myself in, in situations um, that I think, wow, I really need to write about this. The first story that I was really proud of, I just met this guy walking down the street and we had this conversation and I just, I went home and I told Joel, my partner, um, all about it. And I was like, I need to write this down. Just real life, just um, meeting people and chatting to people um, is, uh, is what inspires me, really. I don't think I've ever bought an umbrella, just acquired them as I've gone along. That's what I'm thinking about as I'm walking down the Armo Road. A man walking the same way as me asks if there's room under the umbrella for one more. I laugh because I think he's joking, but he's not, and I'm hardly going to say no. I was going to say that I avoid talking to strangers, but I suppose that's not actually true. I don't want to miss the opportunity for a good story, but still, I'm always nervous. I suppose that I usually keep an eye out for an escape route in case someone tries to murder me or asks if I'm a Catholic or a Protestant. In any case, I can't avoid talking to this man, or I could, but walking along in silence would probably be worse than talking. He seems nice anyway. Thanks for sharing your umbrella, he says. You're not dressed for the weather, I say. He's wearing a grey sweatshirt and grey shorts. I would guess that he's in his early 30s. He offers to hold the umbrella and I automatically say, no, that's okay, which I think is because I think he might steal the umbrella. 
I immediately regret it though because my arm is a bit tired and it's hard to hold it over both of us and honestly it wouldn't matter if he did steal the umbrella it's not even my umbrella and he doesn't have a coat on he asks if I'm going as far as the Ormo Bridge I tell him that I am I'm going beyond there to Botanic Gardens are you studying at Queen's he asks no, I'm living in Belfast for the summer and working in a cafe up the road. I'm studying in Dublin. Oh, what are you studying? Politics. He says, ah, in a knowing kind of way. My course is actually international relations. I don't know why I didn't just say that. There's a lull. What, what do you do? It's a stupid phrase and it sounds stupid coming out of my mouth. I'm just an unemployed bum, he replies. It's such an old fashioned way to say it. I feel bad for asking. Not that I think there's anything wrong with being unemployed, but because of the way he said it. Ock, you're not a bum, you're just unemployed. He backtracks and says, well, I wouldn't say I'm a bum, even though he just did. I just got out of prison there on the 3rd of July. Oh, I say. I have a mad urge to ask what he was in prison for, but I don't. <laughs> I'm just letting you know who I am, you know? Do you smoke grass? He asks, proffering a wisdom joint. Ah, no, I'm grand. I find it makes me a bit paranoid. My reservations have more to do with smoking weed on the street with a stranger, but I think it might be rude to say that. I like that, he says. You like feeling paranoid? No, it just makes me think about things in a different way, you know. I'd be sitting in the house and I just start laughing, thinking about stuff. He stops walking then, and so I stop too. I don't want him to get rained on. He points out scars on his calf and neck. That's where I was stabbed, he says. He offers no further context, and I'm certainly not going to ask. I'm just letting you know who I am. What's your name, anyway? I'm Deirdre. My name's Michael. My oldest brother is called Michael, the one who was married that summer. It's a good name, my brother's name, so I'm predisposed to like him. We shake hands, awkward at such close quarters. I'd give you a hug, but I wouldn't want people talking about you. He says, what age are you? 22. He's surprised. I looked young for my age and I had braces at the time. He tells me that he had braces too. I don't know if I'd bother, but the government is paying for them. I tell him, you have to get something from the government. I get a thousand pounds a month for doing nothing. My sister says it's not fair. I get more for doing nothing than she gets for working. The government doesn't consider me to be homeless, though, because I just got out of prison there on the 3rd of July. I try to say something eloquent about how food and shelter are human rights, but I have to say it quickly because we've reached the far end of the bridge, and so it comes out all jumbled. Michael's going straight on to the markets, and I'm turning left down the Stranmill's embankment. He says that it was good to meet me. He shakes my hand again and gives me one of those mannish half-hugs, which is weird because I don't know him. As I walk on, he calls after me, asking what I'm doing tonight. Uh, nothing, I reply. Where do you usually go for coffee? We could go for coffee if you'd like. I'm actually okay, pal. Thanks, though. He doesn't seem annoyed, and I'm relieved. We walk away from each other. I feel guilty, though. Maybe he's lonely, and he'd like a friend. I reason with myself that I did the right thing. I can't just meet up with strangers. I should have given him the umbrella, though. It's not even my umbrella, and he didn't have a coat on. Thank you very much. I feel like I feel like such a baby when it comes to writing. I feel like I like know very little, and I'm just kind of trying, trying my best to figure out um, how to do it and what to do with it. Uh, I think it's difficult to find the time and the space to write um, when I'm working nine to five and. You know, life is just very busy and not letting sort of self-doubt get in the way and not saying, oh, this is, this is pure rubbish and a waste of time. Just saying, well, if it is, it's not for you to say, just, you just do the part that you can do. Just write it, even if it's pure rubbish, it's none of your business. <laughs> I suppose I'm, you know, a big socialist <laughs> and I, uh, I think that we live in a very a very harsh system and I don't think that I'm addressing that super directly in anything that I'm writing but I think I'm exploring themes of loneliness and isolation which I think is is a real 
um, byproduct of capitalism and you know, I've written a lot about working kind of service industry jobs and I think that those jobs are hard and um, people and they're very necessary but um, but people are are treated kind of pretty disrespectfully and paid pretty poorly and so I suppose I want to talk about those kind of experiences and just life is tough <laughs> I suppose that's my message <laughs> life's really hard <laughs> I suppose when I when I am right now, I, I am thinking of an audience reaction. Um, I suppose I am mostly thinking of what would make me laugh if I was if I was hearing it, or what would strike a chord with me. I I only know what makes me laugh, and uh, can only live and hope that other people might laugh at the same things. So my partner is um, Joel Harkin, who's um, a very talented singer-songwriter. Um, he's from Donegal as well, um, and uh, we've both been living in Belfast for a few years. Um, and I think we work really well together, um, you know, personally, obviously. Um, but um, we, both, uh, we both really enjoy the art that the other makes and um, we both are very supportive of each other's pursuits. I'm not always the best at kind of focusing, getting the work done and uh, he sometimes um, will just encourage me to sit down and write something and uh, I uh, read through his funding applications or social media posts so we help each other out. The road from Letterkenny to Port New stretches on forever. Out past old Duns, and bless yourself at Conwall Graveyard, and Fintown as the halfway point where Daddy would let you choose the music for the rest of the journey. A CD of Blonde on Blonde must have lived in the car in those years. You still feel the Pavlovian ghost of car sickness when you hear Lay Lady Lay. Just grazing the edge of Glenties and that's the final stretch. You can feel it in your stomach as the car climbs past that crucifix and then you round the corner and see the sea. Six houses below you to your right hand side and Aidan, John, Paul and Mira Eileen. The names of your mother and her siblings rattled off like an incantation. It could be the six of you but they were here first. The two weeks you spend here every year of your childhood seem to expand to eat up the whole rest of the summer. In your memory it's always sunny and warm, unless this is narratively inconvenient. This establishes you as an unreliable narrator from the jump. You are small in the world. The youngest sibling and the third youngest of 24 cousins which has made you feel small and silly always. At home, you live at the far end of a cul-de-sac. A few metres of lawn and driveway may as well be miles. The girls from around the corner in Orchard Grove call around for you sometimes. And sometimes you go, but sometimes you ask your mammy to just say that you're not home, please. They're all nice, but all a year older, and you feel eternally out of step. There are no such geographical barriers in a caravan site. Your best summer friend is Claire Sweeney. Claire Sweeney is better than you in every conceivable way. She is three months older than you, which meant a lot in those days. She is very tanned and you are an almost glowing milky pink. She plays football and wears football jerseys and has friends who are boys and asks you why you wear so much pink. You miserably admit that you don't know why. Sure your mommy buys all your clothes for you. You had liked your clothes until she had pointed out their almost vulgar girlishness. But it's not as if you could suddenly start wearing football jerseys yourself. It would be so transparent. So you wear your pink fleece and pink gingham pedal pushers like a hair shirt. Down at the beach, there is a group of Christian missionaries called the UBMs, United Beach Missions. Your granny christens them the BUMs. For your parents, it is free childcare, and you love it. 
It's funny to think back on now, but at that time of your life, being proselytised to is a very quotidian part of things. You sit on a blue tarpaulin on the sand and learn songs about Jesus, and if you memorise Bible verses correctly, you are rewarded with chewets, which are half melted and lightly encrusted in sand, which is actually the most delicious way to serve a chewet. It is here, at the BUMs, that you first see Kieran. You and Claire are seven, he is eight. He is the second oldest of a family of boys from Straban, and nothing short of perfection. Claire suggests that the only thing to do is to embark on a campaign of anonymous love notes posted through the open windows of his caravan. This is horrifying to remember, even now. It is hard to say what the end goal is here. Perhaps just the thrill of having a shared secret. You may be seven, but you are a realist. Who would look at you next to Claire? Sitting in the long grass on the edge of the caravan site, the sun in your eyes and Claire standing above you, you broach the subject nonchalantly. Do you think he fancies you? I think they all do. Her words are matter of fact. Of course, she is right. The grass is beginning to make you break out in hives. How long do the love letters continue? It could have been weeks and weeks. Equally, it could have been three days. You are inevitably caught by the object of your affection. When Kieran sees Claire, he is obviously delighted. That was you! He grabs her and they wrestle playfully, shrieking. You stand there like an extra. You will never be the kind of person who could successfully engage in playful wrestling. Whatever quality is required is one you lack. Eventually, he turns to you and delivers a fatal blow. Aren't we cousins? Obviously, Kieran is not your first cousin. You know that, like. But alas, it's true. His great auntie and your granda were first cousins, which makes you romantically incompatible. The whole sordid affair is quickly forgotten. Well, you've thought about it approximately once a week in the intervening 19 years, but you hope that everyone else has forgotten. In those years, you read an awful lot of Jacqueline Wilson. You hate, hate, hate the dynamic of the pathetic, sad protagonist and the beautiful, amazing best friend to whom she always feels inferior. You don't want to read about girls like that. You want to read about girls who are brave, girls who do things, girls who can love their friends without taking something away from themselves. That summer ends, and the years go by, and the beach changes. Your uncles sell their caravans, and now you stay in your grandparents' caravan, in the other caravan site. They are at the top of a hill, and you are once more at the far end of a cul-de-sac. Your siblings are going out into the world and leaving you behind. The numbers dwindle until it is just you and your parents in the caravan. The summer you're 11, you arrive in Port New, excited as ever to see Claire. You head down to the beach and sit on the blue tarpaulin. Claire is there. She doesn't come over and say hello. You are there and Claire is there and she doesn't come over and say hello. She doesn't come over and say hello. It is at this point that you turn and leave, go back to your grandparents' caravan, tell everyone you find there that Claire didn't say hello, and this is where your friendship ends. Did you say hello? Your parents ask. No, of course not. This has changed the shape of things altogether. 
You can barely leave the caravan now because of children playing in the green outside. Your daddy puts the rainbow coloured sun hat your godmother gave you on and says that you are now Molly McSwiggin and Molly McSwiggin isn't scared of anyone. It helps a bit, but only a bit. If only I could go back and find you on that beach, Molly McSwiggin and myself, we'd find you on the edge of things, dressed all in pink, and we'd say, please, just go and say hello to Claire. I love to draw, and I just draw a lot for fun, um, and love going to the cinema, love going swimming in the sea, but only if it's kind of temperate enough weather. Because I love writing so much, um, I really feel hesitant, I suppose, to put too much pressure on it. Um, I don't want to kind of <laughs> um, ruin something I love so much for myself. Um, I would love to, uh, to just get more time to write. I love performing, so I, um, I hope to get more opportunities to perform in front of people. Um, um, I haven't been published anywhere yet, so I would really, I would love to, um, love to publish something. But at the same time, I'm, I'm trying not to kind of let myself get too caught up in wanting to maybe impress other people or something. I just, um, I just would like to like to write more, and I've just uh, been very lucky to have gotten opportunities to, to perform and to share my work, and so I hope that, hope that keeps going.